Yo, my name is Benjamin and in this video tutorial I want to cover the basics of components in Framer. From variants to variables, adding hover states and more. Let's start with a simple button. I'll hit Command K to bring up the quick menu and then I'll select create component and I'll name it button. Now here we are on an isolated component canvas where we can make changes to the component. And we can use the breadcrumb bar at the top here to go back to the original page. And if we want to go back to the component canvas, we can simply double click on the component instance. Here on the top right, you have a few additional options like the ability to add the component to a library. On the canvas here, I can either add a new variant or a temporary variant, also called just a hover or pressed state. Now the biggest benefit of using components is reusability. If I go back home and I duplicate this button, we now have two instances of this button. Now if we double click back into the component and we change the fill color, and then we go back home, you can see it has applied this change to both instances. And you can use component instances across different pages as well. So in essence, components are elements that you can reuse across your various pages. In Framer, a single component can contain multiple variants. So let's have a look at adding a hover variant first. We click here, select hover, and that adds the hover variant. With the default variant selected, we can change the fill color to black. Then we can select the hover variant and change it back to blue. And just like that, if we go back and give our page a preview, both our buttons now have a hover state. Now that's how easy it is to work with interactive variants in Framer. Of course, we can always customize the transition options by clicking here and we can pick between an easing or a spring curve. Now let's have a look at adding a normal new variant. With variant one selected, I can click over here to add variant two. Now variants are essentially just different sets of properties and styles within a single component. So for variant two, we can customize properties like the border radius to make it more of a pill like button. And then we can also give this its own hover state with maybe a purple color instead of blue. If we now go back to the home page and select one of our buttons, we now have this variant drop down in the properties or we can change the default variant. And if we now give this page a preview, you can see we have two variations of a single button component. Sometimes you might want a property to be accessible and editable from here, from the instance level without being baked into the component. This is where variables come in. So let's make the hover tint color something you can edit from outside the component. I'll select the hover state, go to fill and click the little plus icon to create a new color variable. This modal gives you an overview of your variables. You can change the sorting, the name and the default values. I've named this one hover and set the default color to be yellow. And if I now go back, I can also assign this variable to the fill property of the second hover state. And we can see this reflected in the property panel as well. Fill is now pointing to the hover variable instead of its own color. And upon previewing, we can see they're both yellow on hover now. Now, because we used a variable, we can now override the hover color here from within the property panel. It's yellow by default and we can turn it into any color we'd like without having to edit the component. So we used a variable to share a color across two variations of our component. Plus we made that value editable from outside the component as a property. Framer had already done this for our text layer turning the contents into a text variable. And Framer does this when you create a component containing only a single text layer, which we assume is likely to be a button. So the title is also available from the property panel here and we can override the contents. Next, let's have a look at sizing. 
Our buttons are now frames with fixed sizes. But with the first variant selected, I can head over to the width property and set it to fit content instead. This turns our component into a stack, meaning we can also control its size with gap and padding. We kept height a fixed value, so I only need left and right padding. If we now go back to the home page, we now have an auto sizing button. And if we now were to change the title properties, the sizing of our button will adapt to the contents. Now it's important to note that instances like these two buttons over here can override the sizing options as they are defined in the component. In this case, I can set width to a fixed value for this button instance, even though within the component, the default value of width is set to be auto sized. Now, finally, before we look at some different examples of components, I wanna quickly go over inheritance within components. Just like with breakpoints, within a component, you have a primary variant and all other variants inherit changes from the primary and each variant can overwrite properties from the primary like we did with the radius on variant 2. So additions to a component like this frame or changes in layout are best done from the primary. As you can see, everything I do to this frame is inherited across all our other variants even changing the sorting of the stack here. But I can select the same layer here in variant two and also make changes. These are overrides. So I've now overridden the opacity value. So this was a quick look at all of these fundamental concepts within components. Now let's have a look at some different examples in which we'll likely run into some of the same concepts in different scenarios. Starting with a toggle, which is a good example of how you can animate between variants. Let's turn this into a component again. I'll call it toggle and I'll quickly add a second variant in which I'll move the inner frame to the right hand side. I'll also make this one blue. And now let's animate between these on tap. So I can add an interaction to my variant by clicking and dragging from the connector over here and connecting variant one to variant two. So here we're saying on tap, switch to variant two. And I can click outside of the popover to confirm. Now we do the same for variant two. We select it, click and drag the connector to variant one and click on the canvas to confirm. And we can go back and give this a preview and we can see our toggle is working. Now we can go back into the toggle and change the transition options here. Maybe make it a bit bouncier. And there we go. Now here we might want the active color to be a variable, which is a good example of assigning a variable to a specific variant. So I can go to variant two, create a color variable, and it's now only assigned to variant two, which is when the toggle is enabled. And again, I can overwrite the property on the instance level here. So now we have a toggle component where we can edit the active color to anything we'd like without having to create new sets of variants. Now we could quickly try a different transition setting like an easing curve that's a lot slower. Now note that even the transition options are inherited from the primary variant. So I'll quickly set it back to be a spring curve and then let's have a look at changing the trigger, which is now set to on tap. We can edit the interaction options in the top right corner here. So I could, for instance, select on a pier as the trigger and now it will automatically switch to variant two on load instead of having to tap on it. I'll add a delay of two seconds to make this easier to see. So now every time either the page loads or you manually switch back to variant one, it will wait two seconds and then switch to variant two. Now that we've covered the basics plus interactions, let's see if we can apply our knowledge to something more realistic 
like this feature block that shows unique content depending on the item you click in the sidebar. So let's kickstart this by creating a new component and adding our second variant. Now we want to be able to click on item two and then showing a unique set of content, which can be anything really. So I'll go ahead and I'll first duplicate the circle here, which is my dummy content from within the primary variant. I'll also set visible to no on the first circle here, just to avoid me accidentally editing it. And I'll customize this duplicated version so we can tell them apart later. And once I'm done customizing this, I'll do the same here. I'll duplicate number two, creating a third element, and I'll hide number two and customize number three so we can tell them apart. I'll speed this part up because I spent way too long customizing the, uh, the gradient here and uh, that's not really the point, so uh, yeah. And now we're back. So I have these three unique sets of content that I can now show and hide within different variants. I'll set visible to yes on the first circle within variant one again, and I'll hide it within variant two, where I can now select the second circle and bring that one back into view by setting visible to yes. So now we can add the interaction links which we can also do by selecting a frame or stack and hitting L. And we can drop it onto variant two. Then we can select the first item and drop it onto variant one. Keep in mind that you can only add these interactions from frames and stacks. It doesn't work on a text layer itself. Finally, we can update the colors to match the active items by changing the opacity. And let's give this a preview. There we go. We have our first two items working. Now let's get back into the card component here and add our third variant. Within interactive components, it's usually easiest to draw your interaction links from within the primary variant. So here I'll select the third item. I'll hit L and I'll drop it onto variant three. And now it has already added the same interaction to the same layer within variant two and three. And all that's left is to swap out these elements again using the visible property. And then changing the opacity of our text layers to reflect the active item. And that should do the trick. If we go back and give this a preview, all our links are now working and we have a functional component that can be used as a feature block on a website. As a final example, let's have a look at making an accordion, a component that collapses and expands on click. I want to point out that this is set up using stacks and the accordion itself has a height that's already set to auto, which is very crucial for this to work well. So let's start by adding a new variant. The effect we're after is being able to click on it and have it reveal the contents or the answer below. So let's start with the answer section. I'll start by setting opacity to zero from the primary variant and then setting it back to one on the second variant. Doing this before we toggle the visible property ensures that it will actually also animate when the answer comes back into view, which is just a nice little touch. Now we can set visible to no from the primary variant and then bring it back on the second variant. I can also give these variants a better name, making them easier to recognize and tell apart. Then we can rotate the little plus icon, turning it into a close icon in the open variant. And we can play a bit with the opacity value, for example. Next, let's add our interactions. So first ensure that height is correctly set to auto, and then we can click and drag from the connector to add an interaction from close to open and vice versa. 
And with the interactions in place, we can go back to the main page and give it a preview from there to see that we have a functional auto sizing component. And if you're not happy with an overwrite, like maybe we want to match the opacity here, you can right click on any property and click reset overwrite to restore it back to the values from the primary variant. As a final tweak, we can make the spring curve a bit faster and bouncier. And we can go back and give that another preview. And that's pretty much it. For components that change height, it's recommended to preview it from within the page, like the web page here, as the preview from within the component view won't adapt to the size changes. And that's pretty much it for this video. I hope it was helpful. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time.